Hello, my name is Eric Stephen, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. Father, thank you for, for Vicki. Thank you for the blessing of life and the way that you care for us and the way that you um, don't abandon us. Jesus, I'm just so moved and so um, grateful for the fact that you became flesh and blood and walked among us and died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. And give us this opportunity to just to sing and to be with one another and to wrestle uh, with the burdens and the aches of this world. And Holy Spirit, we ask as we listen to your words and as we wrestle with your words that you would give us courage to believe what's true and um, to push away what's false, but not to hold against one another the way things are said, but to be seekers of what is good and right. I ask this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Um, so I don't know if you've noticed, but in our culture, there is a culture war going on in this sense that people are against each other all the time. And it's very generational. In fact, maybe you're familiar with this phrase, right? Okay, boomer. Right? So who's a boomer? A boomer is somebody who was born after World War Two and then until like 1960. I mean, there's arguments, but but it's a contemptuous statement. Okay, boomer, you don't know what you're talking about, right? But 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 the letter generations, they've got problems too with each other, apparently, right? Uh, it says right here that Gen Z is calling Gen X the Karens, right? Usually racist, homophobic, transphobic, any phobic you can think of, and of course because. The Gen Xers, you know, their whole mode is like, whatever, right? That's W up here, whatever about you. It's just so precious that you would call me that, right? So there's this conflict between the letters. There's a contempt that we have for one another. But guess what? Old people have this issue too. Agatha Christie says young people think the old people are fools, but the old people know the young people are fools. <laughs> right? <laughs> but... The thing is, it has gotten worse and worse. Like, and as you look at your social media, you'll see that, right? And you and I, like, we do gravitate to the people who are like us, right? And so if you, yep, the people who have kids gravitate to each other. The people who are in college gravitate towards each other. The people who are in high school or college or whatever life stage, you gravitate because you think these people know what's going on in my life. Those other people don't. I don't know any 14-year-olds who roll out of bed and say, looking, so looking forward to playing Halo with my 70-year-old friend, right? And I know that there are no 70-year-old friends hopping out of bed saying, where is my 14-year-old Halo friend, right? That's not how it works, right? And so the thing is, is you guys say, okay, well, that's true. I see that in the culture, but that's not how I am. I'm not that way. Uh, but I just had two conversations this week where at least people in our church, have, and I included in this, have picked up the label, right? So they refer to themselves as Gen Xers. I do this because I'm a Gen Xer, right? I identify with Gen Xers. I love the whatever statement because it gives me a lot of power over you. Like, I don't care what you have to say, whatever, right? Like, I'm, I'm you know, I'm much better than you, right? It's, it's, it's easy to pick these things up we were at the soup supper which was crazy last night there were people everywhere there was a photo booth out there and we couldn't get some of the gen zers to get their picture taken so like you know there was a little generational conversation going around the photo booth about oh those gen zers are always taking pictures of themselves until it's formal and we want to take a picture of them so even though it's in fun we pick up what the culture says when it comes to like generational things, right? And guess what? In the first century, this is how it was. This is how it was. There's still generational problems going on. 
And Paul wants to deal with that. But before Paul deals with that, he we're in 1 Timothy, and he tells us in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, so if you don't know what 1 Timothy is, New Testament, second half of your Bible, just look for the numbers, one, you'll find it eventually. It's a letter by Paul to Timothy, and he tells Timothy, just in case he doesn't get to see Timothy, why he's writing the letter. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, he says, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. So he's saying, Timothy, I want you to know how, to, how the church is supposed to conduct itself. Now, I want to talk about God's household really quickly here. Because God's household, the people he's referring to, is the people who get together around this right here. God's body broken and his blood poured out with this anticipation of God making all things new and a celebration of his re- resurrection. So it's how we hang out together what we do together when we're in worship. And then it's the household of God is also what you do with the people of God outside of the gathered place. It is how you conduct yourself, what you do, right? And this is very important because he says, in referring to God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So Paul's writing to Timothy. Timothy is in Ephesus. Ephesus is where the second wonder of the world is, where Artemis is. He's making a point. He's saying, guess what? Artemis, one of the biggest gods in the first century, in in this area, in the Greco-Roman world, not living. There's only one living God. And this, the church, the gathered people, and how they conduct themselves is how we're going to know what is true. So the way you and I, as followers of Jesus, interact with one another is a proclamation of truth, and it is a foundation of what is true. And you hear me say that, and you're probably like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a serious, serious thing. You and the way that you conduct yourself are a proclamation of who Jesus is and what kind of foundation truth has. Like People can understand and taste and experience truth by the way you and I engage with one another. And then Paul says, oh, well, this is really interesting, though. It's not really about what you do. He says, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. And then he goes back to this beautiful poem that probably the church repeated every Sunday. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. So if you don't hear anything else I say today, the way you conduct yourself has little or no meaning if it doesn't come out of an experience with Jesus. The way you conduct yourself, the way you engage with one another, has little or no meaning if it doesn't spring forward from Jesus. And that's going to be important as we begin to talk about what it means to conduct ourselves in the church. So, our text is in 1 Timothy, and I have really fancy slides today. Um, We're starting at 1 Timothy, verses 1 through 16. So, we're going to look at the first two verses. It says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. So we know from what Rod said last week as he went over chapter 4 is that there's this encouragement that Timothy lead by example. And now he's saying, Timothy, this is the way you're to engage with people in the church. And this is how everyone else is to engage. And the first thing he says is that you are not to rebuke older men harshly. Right? So no whatevers. Right? This word in the Greek is to basically humiliate someone violently in public. Right, so you're not to take older men and point out their faults in front of everybody. You're not to embarrass them. And I would argue older women too. You don't get, you don't get to just do it. You don't get to do that. And so there's this, but, and then he goes on and he says, look, and, and not just that, but you have to exhort them. That word exhort is encourage. And it is the, 
word that all Christianity is based on. You and I are called to exhort one another. That means to give one another courage, to come alongside one another and give them courage. So you're not supposed to confront an old man and humiliate him. You're actually supposed to come alongside him and give him courage. And in the NIV, I don't know why it says treat, because it really should just say and encourage, and encourage, and encourage, and encourage. Because the call is for you and I to one another is to come alongside and give courage. But Paul wants us to understand that we're doing this in the context of family. That means that when you look around here, the people who are old enough to be your fathers are your fathers. The people who are old enough to be your mothers are your mothers. When you look around and you're old enough to be the, the parents of some of the people here, then you are their fathers and mothers. When you look at your peers, these are your brothers and your sisters. And here's the thing about family. You don't get to choose them. God does. You don't get to choose your spiritual family, and you don't get to choose your physical family. But the beauty about your spiritual family is that they are all under Christ. Right? I can disown being a seepin, but I'm still a seepin because the genetics of seepinhood are wound into me, and I can't undo them. And it is the same with the Holy Spirit. So if you look around here, locally, for you who say this is my church, you're stuck with these people. Sorry. These are your family. These are the people God calls you to love. These are the lay your life down for, to treat carefully the, the young women in this church and the young men to, to treat each other with purity, to care for the older men and women, to care as parents for the younger one. This is, this is how the pillar of truth is expressed. This is how the gospel goes forward. This gets me all exciting. It's not actually boring because you guys are my family, right? You're my uncles, my aunts, my brothers, and my sisters. Now, Paul is relying heavily on Jesus in this, right? Because Jesus in Mark chapter 3, he's just done a bunch of crazy stuff, and his family's a little worried, and they come looking for him, and the crowd's like, hey, you know, your mom and your brothers are here. And he's like, who? Who are my mom and dad? Who are my brother? Or who's my mom? Who are my brothers? Anyone who does the will of God is my mother and my brother and my sister. All of a sudden, he, he's, Jesus is like, no, no, no. We're going back to the way it's supposed to be, a brotherhood of people, a sisterhood of people. Right? That's what we're invited into. Even more powerfully, at the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus looks down at the cross, and he looks at his mother, and he looks at the disciple John, and he says, behold your mother. Behold your son. Right? He changes the way things are. And Paul's relying heavily on this because the gospel moves forward when you and I care for one another, another like family. We begin to redefine what is good and what is right. Now, Paul's going to make a shift, and a shift that maybe we're not completely used to, and that is that Paul is going to talk about widows. And we don't talk about widows a lot. But Paul's going to talk about widows, and he says in verse 3, give proper recognition to those who are really in need, to the widows who are really in need. Give honor. It literally means financially support the women who are in need, the widows who are in need. So, so you need to understand what a widow was in the first century versus what a widow is now, so that you can at least understand what's happening, and then we can begin to talk about what it means for you and I as a family. Okay. So first, in the first century... If you were a woman of married, marrying age, you were probably married. The state of a woman was married. Here's why. There weren't a lot of women. Why were there not a lot of women? Well, in the Greco-Roman world, it's not true for the Jewish world, but in the Greco-Roman world, when you had a baby who was a girl, especially more than one girl, this is going to sound a little brutal, but if dad was present, he might just stab the baby with a sword. If he didn't have the guts to do that. They would carry them out into the forest and leave them there. Right? So there was actually a shortage of women to marry in the first century. The other thing you need to understand is that if you made it to the age of 15, 
in the first century, just as a man or woman, a girl or boy, then your dad most likely was dead. There's a 40% chance that you didn't have a father. Right? So widowhood, though there were not many women, widowhood was actually pretty common. In the Greco-Roman world, widows were pushed to the edges of society. They were marginalized. And the reason they were marginalized is they're expensive, right? If the, you know, you don't, there's not, a, I mean, it's not like the Greco-Roman world is full of money and everybody's happy. Like, just like us, families felt overburdened. And so usually you didn't have a very good life if you were a widow. Now, if you think of the Jewish world, what's, what's interesting about that is the word for widow means one without voice. So it helps us at least understand the condition. Now, in the Jewish law, there were lots of provisions for widows, but it was still one without voice because the only way she could have a voice was if she had a husband or if she had a father who took her back in or if there were brothers who brought her in. Right? That's the only way she would have voice. So the widow in the first century, regardless of Jewish or Greco-Roman, but we're mostly on Greco-Roman because that's where we are in Ephesus, was marginalized, right? was pushed to the outside. Now I want you to hear what Paul says to the church about widows and how to care for them because he's going to show how the gospel turns things upside down. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion, or you can piety, their piety, into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow is really in need and left all alone, puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while he lives. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their, and this is interesting, he doesn't say widows, relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Paul's trying to say, I don't know how any stronger to say this, so I'm just going to say you're just like an unbeliever and you've just completely gone against your faith if you're not going to take care of the people that God has given you. Right? So the first interesting thing is Paul says, okay, even though everybody's a family, the family needs to take care of the people in it. So the children need to, to take care of mom. So if you move this forward into modern times just for a second, families inside the in church here, guys, people who have moms, people who have moms, how are you going to take care of your mom? That, that is a question that you should be talking about. How are you going to take care of mom? How are you going to take care of the people in need in your family? Because you're called to them. But then that question still is pressed out to how are we going to take care of the people in need in the community? But I just want you, if you haven't, don't hear anything else, and I say this a lot, but stop on that one. How are you going to take care of mom? That's a conversation as, a, as kids you should be talking about. And with dad, how are we going to take care of mom? Just as a, a statistic to kind of hold on to, and I know this, I mean, statistics aren't always helpful, but the average age of a widow in the United States is 59. So that's, that's kind of shocking. So you might want to think, how do you take care of mom? That's something you want to have in the back of your head. Then he says, okay, well, if there is a widow who doesn't have anybody to take care of her, she needs to pray day and night to God. What he's saying is he needs to throw, she needs to throw herself on the mercy of the church. Okay, church, I need your help. Jesus, I need deliverance. Not go after the only way she can make money, which is with her body in the first century, right? To go live a life of, he uses the word pleasure, but what he's talking about here is go be a prostitute, go Figure out how to use your body to make money, to pay rent, to do what you need to do, right? So there's an invitation even to the one who's marginalized to live a life where it shows that God is the one delivering her and she's not the one delivering her, which is a hard position, which means when we're family, we have to be hyper aware of what's going on. 
And then he says, okay, if you're not willing to take care of your relatives, then you're not a follower of Jesus. That's pretty much what he's saying. If you can't take care of the people who God has given you, you're not a follower of Jesus because you refuse to do that. Here's why I say Paul is turning things upside down. What Paul is saying is that we as a church have to take the people who are marginalized and bring them into the center so that we as a church revolve around them. So in modern times, yes, we have widows in our community. In fact, we have one sitting here in our community right now. We have widows, and she can talk to you about how the church is cared for and what God has done. She has That's beautiful, right? Correct, Samantha? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but there's more than that. Because if, if widow means one without voice, there's a lot of people who don't have voice. And so the first thing, the way we proclaim gospel is to look around our community and say, who doesn't have voice? Who doesn't have voice in our community? And how do we move them to the center and care for them and give them voice and give them some power? Right, to give them a way of speaking for themselves and saying, this is what I need. Because you can't hear people on the margins, so you don't know what they need. And margins look different in every community, right? But what that does is when you revolve around the people who don't have voice, you begin to be able to do that more effectively in the world. And that's what Paul is trying to establish here because widows dominate the church at this time. They make up a huge part of the population. So, second part. And here's the cool part. The order of the widow. So, no widow may be put on the list of widows unless she's over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people helping those in trouble and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds the order of the widow this is not you get to be oh you turn 60 you get put on a list and we'll help you out no the order of the widow is widows who have committed to not remarry and who are going to dedicate their life to the service of the community and so if you read the qualifications there are much like qualifications for elders Right? She has to be a woman of one man. She's got to be someone who's hospitable. She has to be someone who takes care of the community, who knows how to be a parent. And what's really cool, if you start reading church history, you learn that the Syrian church for four centuries had the order of the widow. And most early churches did, though the deaconess replaced it. But the Syrian church kept it for four centuries. And these widows were everywhere. They ran the church. They ran all the kind of hospitality in the community. And they were a very powerful service community. But they were older women who committed their life to basically being the, the early nun, right? They were going to become the early nun and serve, but they weren't cloistered. They were actually ministers in the community. And they had time. And so being on the list meant, guess what? The church paid you to do that. It paid you. So what I think is beautiful here is that Paul is saying we, as a church, what we do is we take the most marginalized person and we bring them to center, we pay them, and they ha- we have them serve us and care for us and minister to us and look up after our needs. Which is kind of, I mean, it's exciting to me and a little mind-blowing. It's like Jesus always does this. He says, the weak person is the one who actually has the power in the kingdom. The weak person is the one who can speak the most truth to you if you're willing to bring them into the middle and listen and not keep them on the margins. And so he says, well, there are some rules to how those people are going to be put on that list. And he begins to talk about younger women in verse um, 11. He says, as younger widows, do not put them on this list. For their central desires overcome their dedication to Christ. They want to marry. Thus, they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they 
become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to say. So I counsel younger widows to marry and to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. So what Paul is saying is there, there is a group of women who've made this vow, and it, if they're younger, it's very easy for them to break it because there's this longing for companionship. There's this longing to have an established family. And when they've given all this free time, they go from house to house, and they really aren't doing anything. Now, I would argue to you that men would do the same thing. It's not like women are, this is characteristic of women. I mean, I know that if I had a lot of free time and I was just young, I would probably go from house to house and play video games. That would be what I would do. And then he would have that here and said, he would, he would say that the men tend to move from house to house playing video games, eating Doritos, and not taking care of anybody. So I'm pretty sure that that's... So, but I think what's important here is that Paul is very concerned about what? How the gospel goes forward. And what, where do you gain maturity as a young woman in the first century? By getting married, establishing a family, learning how to take care of it, and being able to take care of other people. Right? So the order of the widows is a really cool thing that the church used to have. And it's pretty powerful. And a beautiful picture of the gospel. The last part, you got the click for me, is the rich women. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her care, she should continue to help them and not let the church be burdened with them, so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. So the church, if you go back to Acts 6, you'll find this. The church is very much in the business of taking care of widows, so much so that that's how deacons got formed because the elders and apostles got overwhelmed and they couldn't take care of all of the widows and so they hired, they got deacons to do that whose whole job was to take care of people. But what you'll find in church history and you find in the in kind of hinted at in the Bible is that there are these rich women who care for people who are followers of Jesus, who have means, and they care for widows. And Paul's saying, encourage those women who have money and who are caring for widows to keep doing that and to not send them back to the church because it's financially hard for us. Right? So that's, that's, but I think if you, okay, that's cool. I don't know anyone who has widows in their care at this moment in that way, but wealth is a really important thing in the church, in this and it's not just the tithe that you put forward. It's how you use your wealth to care for people. Because again, the way that the gospel goes forward, the way that things transform in the world, the way people understand what is true is when they see a community and they enter a community and they experience a community who's willing to sacrifice its wealth for the care of other people. Both internally as a community and as individuals. When they begin to hear the stories, the, the predominant story of the members of the community is, well, I'm caring for this person. Oh, I'm, this, is, this is my ward. Oh, this is the people I'm caring for. When that's the narrative that everyone is speaking and doing, it's transformative. Now, this is a really beautiful thing. It gets me super excited. It's what, you know, I want the village to look like. And I actually think there's testimony after testimony after testimony. In fact, Vicki testimony if you know her story is a testimony of that right but i'll tell you what if you think wow this is a really cool program and i want to do that you will stop after like a month right because you cannot do it by just saying these are really cool principles and paul and jesus came up with some really cool teachings and we should do that because it'd make our life better because you just can't do it. I don't want to do it. Because helping people, caring for people, and being cared for stinks. Sometimes it feels good, right? But most good care, if you're the person being cared for, doesn't always feel that good, right? Because wounded people, people who are struggling, have to feel people poking their fingers around. And people who are helping have to carry the burden of helping, which means their finances, which means their time, which means their energy, right? You can't do it. I mean, the reality is you can't do anything 
for very long, very well. Unless you understand this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. You can flip that for me. Thanks. Dear friends, this is John writing. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be his atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. It's this weird thing that you and I have to have an experience of Jesus. And the way that we can experience Jesus as we invite him into our life is to act out the way of Jesus. It's kind of like getting on a plane and asking the pilot, are we going to land in Japan? And he's like, I don't know. We'll see when we land there. In the sense that you and I have to believe that as we step into caring for one another, we will have a divine experience if we are willing to do it in the way of Jesus. Because when I love you and you love me, and the Spirit of God in us joins in that, there's a divine experience that happens that's profound and propels us forward into love and care. Because there's no other way to do it. It's, you have to step forward. You can't rationalize, hey, this is a great system and this is how it'll work and everything will be beautiful. There has to be a taste of Jesus, but the only way to taste Jesus is to love people like Jesus loved people. And then you'll experience that. It's this beautiful thing, but you've got to be part of it. You have to engage it. You have to step into it. So, Paul's invitation is real simple. Let's step in and actually believe that you're my family. And some of you are, it's funny because I'm looking around, okay, there's a few of you who could be my dad, or at least my older brother. Um, in the evening service, there's a lot more people who could be your parents. And here, it's like much more brothers, younger brothers, older brothers, and sisters. But this is your family. These are the people that you are called to love. This is who it is. If you love these people here and out there, it will change the world and not just you. One person at a time. Does anybody have any questions, thoughts? Yes, uh, okay, let's do the mic so people online can. Oh, as I think about this question, it's hard to even think about how to ask it because it's so complicated. Um, well, it feels simpler to think of these people as my family and how do I step in. But when you have a very complicated family, like your nuclear family, mm -hmm. what do you do? Uh, I would just say I feel tempted to either like sway on one side, which is fend for yourself, or the other, which is I will fix you. And I think I know how to do that, but I don't really. So... I guess my question is, yeah, how do you, like, care for your family? I'm sure, yeah, I have ideas about it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, I, I, so one, I'll just say that in the early church, obviously, there's a different understanding of family structure than mm -hmm. it is now. And you are much more interconnected and you need each other. Mm -hmm. So even those family conflicts, you know, are... You got three, your uncles and your aunts. Everybody lives next to each other, and yeah. you're you're having that. But I would say that the call to honor your mother and father and to care for them, however that looks, where is is something that you can do. I want to say this complicated answer. 
it has to do with your heart, not necessarily yeah. with what you're doing. Yeah. And I think that's part of the even the generational understanding, like what mm -hmm. that kind of taps into. Where's my heart when it comes to my mom? Yeah. Even if my mom is kind of crazy and it's hard to be around her, where's my heart? Okay. And how do I set good boundaries and still love her or my brother or whatever? Yeah. That's right. So not completely avoiding the issue. Right. Yeah. Okay. Not avoiding the <laughs> issue would be a good, Sounds good. good answer to that. Anybody else have any thoughts? Holy Spirit pushing on your heart in any way? No? Going once. All right. Yes, go for it. I think as I've been meditating on First John, as that was like what we studied before, <clears throat> it so deeply talks about like loving God and how do we love God? We love one another. And, and so when I think of loving people who we have these like wounded relationships with, what's so transformative is praying for them. Because mm -hmm. if your heart is in a stance of praying for them and care and nurture, it's hard in your actions to then be against them. And so I think it's okay for your first step of love to just like give that person to Jesus. And it doesn't mean any sort of service or any right. sort of like, I'm going to fix you, but just like, Jesus, would you please help? This person's really hurt me and they feel like an enemy, but they're related to me. No, that's good. That's very wise. Thank you. All right. I think I will go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship you. I just pray that you would uh, bless the rest of our time together, the time we sing, the time we eat, and uh, the time we wrestle with one another as family. And I ask that in your holy name, Jesus. Amen.